is from a thinking of quitting or throwing in the towel in our industry. That's a big number. So I really want that thought to evaporate today from you guys, your mind. And um, yes, it's tough, isn't it? Yes, the hours are long. Yes, the money cannot be great. And yes, it can be unsocial. It's an extremely rewarding career. It really is. And, and I think today with our two guests, they're going to tell us their stories, their journeys, on how they came up through the ranks, how they started, their ups and downs. So you guys have the key to your future in our industry. So that's really important. You have the key to your future. So now more than ever, do we need to innovate you, motivate you, and educate you? And I think with today we're going to do that. So starting first, we've got um, two great chefs. We're very lucky to have them. They're giving up their own time to talk to you guys today about their journey. Uh, so today we're starting with Danielle Alvarez from Head Chef at Fred's in Paddington. Uh, she's got a great story. And also we've got Dan Hong, Executive Chef of Mr. Wong and Miss Cheese. So it's going to be a fantastic day. Um, these guys have got so much energy and a good story to tell. So let's first welcome Danielle. How are you today, Danielle? I'm very good, thanks. Good. Nice to see such a good turnout. It's nice, isn't it? So, Danielle, as I pour your water, tell me, um, tell us about you. Tell us, pretend none of us know anything about you and your journey into cooking in the food world. Okay, well, um, cooking was actually not something that I imagined I would do when I was in my teenage years. A lot of chefs um, start their careers super young. I'm not one of those people. I guess I started towards the later end. Um, I was born in Miami, Florida to Cuban immigrant uh, parents and family. So food was obviously always a big part of our life growing up. Um, very important. At every family gathering uh, was centered around the meal. And I was always in the kitchen with my mom. Um, I, I went to university and I studied art history. Completely unrelated, although the artistic sense, you can see how that kind of goes together. And when I started working in the, that industry after I graduated, I quickly realized it's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to be a bit more involved, do something where I could, you know, be more creative myself rather than just talking about other people's work. So why cooking? Um, I guess it was just one of those points where I knew it was something that I loved, and I had I had never worked in a restaurant. I didn't know anything about restaurant life, but it sounded cool to me, and so I thought I would just give it a shot. And, and did someone? You know, steer you in that direction, or was it just a thought? I mean, no, no, no one just stops art history and goes into cooking. Yeah, well, actually, you. Not, many, <laughs> not many people did. I actually think I had a lot of people tell me not to get into the industry, which I think happens a lot, which is such a such a tragi tragedy because I I owe a lot of things in my life to this industry, and the excitement and the energy and the faraway places that it has taken me, I never would have been able to do without working. So, uh, you know, you, you started cooking where? Where was your first job? My first job was at the French Laundry, which is a three Michelin star restaurant. Yeah, so hang on, let's take a step back here. You, you, you <laughs> well, it was, that history. was my first job. <laughs> and your first restaurant. job was one of the best restaurants yeah. in the world. So I went to cooking school. I, I put myself through cooking school. There's a great school in Miami, Florida, which I was lucky enough you know, to be somewhere where there was such great education. Um, and from there, I wrote a pretty bold letter to the French Laundry and sent them a very blank CV and just said I really wanted to work there. And um, I've always believed that if you want to learn as much as possible, you've got to work for the best. And at the time, um, this was back in the mid-early 2000s, French Laundry was at top of the game. And they, they offered me an internship, which I took. So you got an internship in the best restaurant in the world, and, and what was that like? I mean, you know, you have you've done a bit of TAFE for cooking. Yeah. 
you know, that must have been a big, big step. And how yeah. old were you at that time, if you don't mind me uh, asking? At that time, so like I said, I, I decided to start cooking a little bit later. So I would have been 22, 23. Um, and you're 26 now, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. A little bit more. Sorry. Um, uh, it was terrifying. It was definitely a really scary experience walking into a kitchen like that that is performing at the highest level. Um, and pretty much everything that I learned in cooking school, I did not apply any of it while I was in that restaurant. Why? Was Why? Because those jobs, I think sometimes at those restaurants, it's so great to be around, but there wasn't much actual cooking going on. From They wouldn't allow me to cook, you know, and I probably wouldn't have allowed me to cook in a restaurant like that either. So I did a lot of picking herbs, but that's also where I found a connection to the farm. There was a garden, culinary garden, right across the road. And as part of that internship, I got to spend some time in the garden, you know, picking things that morning that were going to be on the menu that night. That was incredibly inspiring for me. And how long did you spend at French Laundry? I was there about a year. So my internship lasted about three months. And then I, I did get a job where I stayed on. Um, and uh, so did about a year and then moved to San Francisco to work in other restaurants. So from picking herbs and, and things like that, did you, um, you know, was there a culture in the kitchen that, that gave you steps to move around and learn and things like that? Or were you boxing? Because you often hear about these famous yeah. restaurants where in might go work um, and they're just thrown in a corner. Yeah, herbs. which, which there, there was a bit of that, but I always think that even if you are put into a corner to do some kind of menial repetitive job, you can still open your eyes and see everything going on around you. And for me, it, even though I was doing these repetitive tasks, I learned so much just from you know, people's body language. I listened. I, I picked up every little thing that I could, even if it wasn't something that I was directly involved in. Mm. So um, where did you go from there, from, from Prince Laundry? So from there, I moved to San Francisco, just um, you know, a wider variety of restaurants um, available. And I think when, when you're young and starting out your career, it's important to you know, give time, give proper time to each restaurant that you work at, but to try to work at different types of restaurants to really find where you want to be. Um, and I worked at a restaurant that was in the Ferry Building, um, which is a very uh, central focus of San Francisco and right outside its doors is one of the best farmers markets that I've yeah. probably ever been to in the world. Yeah, so again, for me, that connection to the produce um, just kept growing. Yeah. So, so as a chef and, and, and you know, you now here obviously in Australia, travel is important for young chefs? Do you think like when uh, they, they might finish an apprenticeship or a course. Do you think it's important for them to go travel overseas and learn, or do you yeah. think we have enough here? Oh, look, there's so much to learn here. I, I don't think it's necessary, but I do think it really gives you a well-rounded perspective of the industry, and um, the more you can see and do, I think the more humble you are, firstly, because you see that there's a million different ways to do something, and, and although one chef might tell you this is how you do something, you'll find another chef somewhere else, maybe in another country that shows you a different way to do it. Um, and I, I, I do think travel is important. It shows you many different perspectives. Mm -hmm. so, so you worked for Alice Waters in Shape and Needs. How did that happen? Because that's, um, don't, don't tell us you just wrote another letter. Well, I actually did just write another I sent a, Well, I sent, a, I sent an email to um, the head chef there at the time. And that was probably one of those moments where the timing was just perfect. But the jobs, that, so this is a restaurant that's been around, um, I think they just celebrated their 46th anniversary. Um, so opened in the 1970s and really changed um, the landscape of American uh, restaurants and cooking and, and largely a big part of the world. Um, and people don't leave that job very often because they're very highly coveted. But someone who had been there 20 years was retiring and so I stepped in and I gave you a shot. And how long did you work there? I was there about four years. And, and what was, I mean you said it, as well as uh, French Laundry was one of the best restaurants in its time, what, what sort of things did you learn there? Um, I, I learned a lot, I, I basically learned how to cook there. It's a, it's a restaurant where the menu changes daily. You meet with the head chef at the beginning of the day around two o'clock 
and talk about what's going to be on the menu that night, and then we all set out to get cooking. So there's no recipes, there's no, um, there's not much in the way of guidelines. So it's very much like you're the chef of that course, and whatever you produce has to be ready come 5:30 when the guests start coming in, and it's got to be perfect. So that again, a very terrifying um, objective, but it taught me everything about cooking. And um, do you think it's important for these guys to have mentors in, in the business, in the oh, industry? Definitely. I think um, trying to go through this in industry without a, a mentor is, you know, like walking blindly in the dark. I think it's important to have someone that's been there before that can encourage you when things get tough, when you feel like you want to do something else, because um, it is incredibly rewarding, but it's only sometimes maybe once you cross a certain point that you can that and feel that and that's why it's up to I think the people that have been in the industry a bit longer to do that for all of you. Do you have a mentor? I have several mentors I think and, and from not just chefs I think from all different um, parts of life. I, I think for me a mentor is someone that can guide you but can also cheer you on and encourage you so um, Alice is one of my greatest mentors, and she's a very busy lady, but she still makes time to catch up with me whenever I need some advice. And um, in the company that I work for, one of my greatest mentors is our food and beverage director, who Dan knows, uh, Frank Roberts. He's a brilliant guy in our industry and has really um, pushed me quite far. So after um, uh, Shaken Knees, what happened then? Um, I got to a point where I, felt like I wanted to make a move, and um, very strangely, I hadn't really anticipated that I would ever be living in Australia, but I, I came here for a holiday and really loved this country. Um, I thought the food scene was incredible, so many talented chefs around, and really, you know, really pushing themselves to create some amazing food um, and dining experiences, and I mentioned this to a friend of mine um, who's a pretty well-connected guy, and he came back to me with oh, well, do you think you might want to move to Australia? Because there's a great company called Mary Vale that's looking to open up a shape and style restaurant here. Um, so really unexpected, really out of the blue, but sometimes things like that in our industry happen. And a few weeks later, I was back, and I was cooking for now all of my bosses and coming up with the idea for friends. So it sounds like a lot of your career with, without saying the wrong thing, it was based on a bit of luck. You know, you wrote, you wrote letters, you, you, you forced your way into restaurant doors, yeah. and, and your position at Fred's, where uh, Justin Hems uh, Justin Hems from the Mirabel Group um, operates. Um, was that an easy, obviously an easy decision to come to Sydney, because it's such a great space, but to get that job and to get in that position, how, tell us how that happened. So, what, I mean, you know, it all kind of starts with a and I do believe that this industry is so dynamic that if you are um, driven and if you've worked hard and you have, you know, a bit of natural talent, you can go anywhere you want to go. And there's opportunities at every turn. Um, so it's just started with a conversation. I came, like I said, I came out and cooked um, for the team at Maryvale. They enjoyed the meal, thank God. Um, and. Um, well, did you have any doubt that they would Well, I, I had doubt that I, I knew what I could do and what I could deliver, but I wasn't sure what the expectation was on their end. Um, I also was a bit worried because for me, the product is so important. And going to another country where you don't really know anyone, you don't know the produce, um, it, it's really inspiring, but it's really daunting because um, things are different everywhere you go. Mm -hmm. um, but. Yeah, like I said, luckily they enjoyed it. And then really from that moment on, we just started creating the idea of Fred's, but then it took a really long time to happen. And did you have much input, like, you know, taking, this is your first head chef job, yeah. I, I yeah. take it. And um, do you have much, is it solely you? Do you say what's on the menu? Do, you know, yeah. Do, yeah. So the menu is, is driven by myself, and then I work with the chefs to um, come up with the dishes. Um, again, it's, it's not a very recipe-based type of cooking. It's very much about the seasons and letting the things come in and deciding what we want to do with them. Um, but yeah, it's it's been, um, I still can't believe that I was given that opportunity.
opportunity. But again, it's a bit of, you know, just going for things, being a little bit crazy maybe, a little bit bold, and someone giving you a shot. So, as I said before, the hours are long, the, the money isn't that great, um, you know, it's stressful. What sort of keeps you going? What drives you, you know, from where you've got to where you are now? What, what keeps you motivated and, and, and pushing on in the industry? Um, I, I couldn't imagine not cooking, really. I, I'm so crazy about what I do. I, I wake up thinking about it, I go to sleep thinking about it. Um, so that drives me. I, yeah, the hours are long, but they're also long in a lot of other professions. Um, but when you love what you do and you're excited about it, it doesn't feel that way. Um, the pressure is hard, and I work in a very open, open, open style kitchen. Yes, you don't have a tip, <laughs> but you do. Well, I, try, I, I try not to, anyways, not when we're open. Um, but kind of managing stress levels in those moments um, can be quite intense. But you, you, have to, you get quite good at it. Which I think also teaches you a lot of other life lessons, just about managing stress, not just at work, but in other parts of your life. Yeah, so tell us a bit about work balance, because I mean, hours and, and the stress in the kitchen, how do you manage that work balance and, and you know, the pressures of the staff and, and the teams below you? Um, I, I have a lot of support. I, I think um, you, again, have to get your people around you. Um, and that could be your family, your friends, or whoever that want to see you succeed and I think when you love what you do and you believe in yourself, those people around you will want to do that for you. Um, I know I have a really good support system at work. I work with really great people um, that want to make sure that we have a good work-life balance. Um, so managing our hours so we don't do too much, making sure you get plenty of exercise outside of work, you know, trying to eat well and, you know, just taking care of yourself. I think. That's, there's a bit of a shift in the conversation around chefs happening these days where the old model of just working yourself to the bone day in and day out for years and years is changing. I the, think. the Gordon Ramsay model's not working in the kitchen now? I don't think it's working anymore. Okay. I think uh, the new generation wants to still live a good life um, and you should be able to. I, I firmly believe that. We're trying to do that at Fred's. I know as a group we're trying to do that in all of our restaurants. Um, to really make sure that people are healthy, happy, and come to work excited every day. Has there ever been a period, perhaps like these guys in, in your career, that you wanted to throw it in and, and give it up and, and do something else? Um, I don't think I've ever wanted to throw it in. I think there's times where I've been like, I just need, I need a break. <laughs> Which I think we can all understand. But usually after, if I do take a holiday or whatever, after a few weeks, I'm ready to come back. It's like you just sometimes you just need to get a bit more energy. But like I said, starting out is tough. And those first years, you don't get a lot of recognition. You certainly don't earn the money to to make you feel like it's worth it. But you've got to think in, in terms of a long game, I think. And that was always my perspective. I knew the early years were gonna be tough, but after a certain point I would start to feel a bit more of the reward. And and that's proving true for me now. So that's right. So there's light at the end of the tunnel, you know, that when, when these guys are thinking, I yeah. might throw it in, you've got to well, keep persisting. you got to keep going, and, and there's nothing wrong with sometimes taking a bit of a step back and taking time off if you're able to afford that. Um, but I do think you've got to stick with it. It's always going to get tough. There's always going to be those moments where you want to throw it in, but if you love what you do, I think you, you should keep going. So you mentioned about um, recognition a minute ago. Um, well, as a chef, I mean, lots of chefs now want to become, there's so many celebrity chefs. Yeah. Um, these guys probably want to become a celebrity chef. Um, recognition and awards and things like that, you, you know, you just won uh, Best New Restaurant by Gourmet, Tra Gourmet Traveler. What do awards and things like that mean to you? Are they important? Um, is it something that these kids should be striving for? Um, I think for me, I've never, I've never strived for that, that award or, or any award. I've never strived to really be in the spotlight, but I will say it does feel good to be recognized for things like that. It does give you a bit of validation, but again, I think if you love what you do and you're putting all your effort into it, you're going to get recognized. Don't do things just for the recognition. I think that stuff will always come if you're doing well. 
has you know the recognition you've got has it impacted on the way you cook the way you work um you know um well it's all pretty new to me i guess so i don't know i don't think it's changed the way i cook it certainly makes me much more aware of who's in the dining room i think i have to focus especially because i'm looking right at most of them being my spot in the kitchen um, I'm a lot more aware of what they want um, and what their expectations are, which can be really challenging. I'm in a pretty interesting spot at the moment, having just come off winning that awards and seeing who comes in the door and what their expectations are. It's, it's a little bit daunting, um, but we're still just trying to do what we do and not change because of it. Yeah. You, um, you work very closely with farmers, and I guess you've learned that from the US and the experience there. Um, you know, do, do you get inspiration from obviously growers and things like that? Menu wise, and in Australia, coming to a new country you didn't understand or know much about, where, where else do you get your inspiration from? I mean, you've got a, there's a whole group of restaurants in your group, I suppose, if you speak to the other yeah. chefs. And well, eating out, I mean, I think Sydney, like I said, and Melbourne and Brisbane and so many cities, and um, Hobart and Tasmania, getting around and eating at all those different amazing restaurants is hugely inspiring. I love seeing what other people are doing with the same things that I have access to. Um, cookbooks are huge for me. I have piles and piles of them. I What's your favorite cookbook? Um, uh, Essentials of um, Italian Cooking by Marcella Milan. If there's like no photos in it, but her writing is so beautiful and it's like that. Do you so, think cookbooks are important? What do you think? Yeah. yeah. I think cookbooks are hugely important. When I first started cooking, I would just sit there and read and look at books and they're such great, they're the textbooks of our of our industry and the new ones come out all the time. When you find chefs and a style of cooking that you like, just try to get as many of those books as you can because it's so valuable. Do you, um, uh, social media and things like that? Oh uh, yeah, so uh, another inspiration, I think Instagram is like an awesome source of inspiration. <laughs> Um, I probably wouldn't have said that a few years ago, but um, I've totally come around. Like I just, you know, you scroll through, scroll through photos and photos, like there's so many images and everything that every chef is doing across the world is almost right there for us to see. I mean, obviously we can't be dining in all these restaurants all the time, but it's really cool to see what other people are up to. Um, I'm going to throw to these guys if they've got any questions along the way. Does anyone have a question they want to ask? Always. Do you want to stand up, if you don't mind? Thanks. And then, sorry, you mentioned earlier about coming into the industry late. For those of us who have come into it a lot, lot later, what would you suggest we, I mean, I think we find that the industry at the moment is looking towards younger apprentices, but for those of us that are older, I mean, how would you suggest we go about So the question is just if you didn't hear. How do you encourage older? Well, sure. How do you encourage older students to get into the industry or want to stay in, in the industry? I look from my perspective, I welcome all um, older chefs. For, from my perspective, I think if you've gone off and you've worked in another career and you've come to cooking later, it's it's a very thoughtful decision and I'm sure not one that was taken lightly. So I really appreciate that kind of mentality. Um, and I think a lot of other chefs in our industry would. Um, I, I don't really know what else you could do beyond just the knocking on doors, but I think showing that eagerness and that passion and willingness to um, start from whatever level, it's gold to any chef that's hiring someone. It's all about attitude. I, yeah, think. I don't think age has got anything to do with it. And I don't yeah. think re big restaurants are, are looking for younger people. I think if you've got the passion and the commitment, like that's Danielle it. said, um, that will open any door. Yeah, and and fitting, you know, obviously fitting in with the culture of whatever restaurant you want to work at is is very important. But I think if you find the type of cooking that you're really wanting to investigate, um, you should be able to get in. And, and I do think chefs should be hiring on on attitude. And you can feel free to uh, ring or write to them yeah, out today. I'm, I'm hiring. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions from the floor? Yes, you at the back. Yeah, thank you uh, for inviting us over here. Um, what a strong but you, you mentioned about 50% of, of, uh, of young people leave. Um, 
it's an idea of benchmarking you know, the expectations that, uh, that the industry has on uh, people coming through. Yeah. Expectations around um, you know, of, of being able to make it, you know, a couple of months to start the business. Oh, um, again, I, I think for me a lot of it is based on um, willingness and attitude. I, I, I don't, I've hired chefs that have had next to no skill, um, which obviously isn't great. You'd like to have people with the basic skills, but I think so many of it, so much of it can be taught, especially on the job learning. Um, that, that happens so quickly in restaurants. And that's kind of what you did as well. Yeah, exactly. And I think that says a lot because, yeah. you know, the dropout rate is high, but I think my, this is why we do this, is to tell the story of successful people who have done well, but also started where you are and um, have come up through the ranks and, and now running one of the best restaurants in the country. So um, that, I believe, any one of you can do it if you have the passion and commitment and the want to do it and forget about the money, forget about the celebrity status, Forget about the media. You can get to it if you want to, and you will. Um, and that's yeah. a good thing. And I will say, um, you do have to be patient with yourselves. Um, I, although it may seem like this all happened quite fast for me, I mean, this spanned across 10, 12 years, and it's only just really happened now where I'm, I'm leaving up a kitchen. Um, so I think it's really important to not go for you know, being a sous chef before you're ready or being a head chef before you're ready, you really do have to spend the time um, absorbing and learning as much as you can. Because once you start going into those more manage management positions, it's a bit harder to step back. Um, although we're constantly learning, I think being a Comey chef and a chef de partie, you, you learn so much in those years and you really should take time to do those years properly. And um, do you see Sydney as home for a long time? Your boss isn't. So. <laughs> yeah, no, I do. I, I love the city. Um, I really do love this country. Um, it's an incredible place to live, and you should all feel pretty lucky. Um, and, you know, summer's coming up, so that's it. Where to from here for you? I don't know. I'm, I guess if you've learned anything about me in, in this conversation, I'm a bit, um, I go where the wind takes me. And we'll see what happens next. But at the moment, very focused on friends and just, you know, maintaining that. So there's a story there. Nothing was planned, um, yeah. and, and it sort of just happened, which is good, and, that, and that's a good opportunity. I saw someone else have that question over. There. Anyone else? Yes. Do At Fred's, it's all subject to change um, because of how we source things. And a lot of the farms that we work very closely with only have a very limited number of, you know, X thing, whether it be, let's say, radishes or, or lettuces or something like that. Um, they might only have them X amount, and that might only last us a couple days, and then we have to change it. It's very dynamic. It's always changing. Um, it's not for everyone, that kind of cooking. I think a lot of chefs like a routine, they like to know exactly what they're doing. Um, and there's plenty of kitchens that do that and do that really, really well. For me, I've always maybe been a bit chaotic and I've like change. Female chefs, bit of a touchy subject over here, I don't know what it's like in the US. We don't have enough. Um, they seem not to uh, be in our kitchens. You, you're sort of leading the charge in that over here, which is fantastic. What, what's your take on that? Um, I think, you know, we, we tend to ask the question a lot around why there aren't more women in, in the kitchens. I, I don't find, for me, it wasn't true that, um, you know, that whole, whole, whole thing about bullying or women not feeling welcome in the kitchen. I always did. And I always felt like if I could perform like the guys, then I should be there too. And I think that most kitchens are, operate under that um, idea now. So there shouldn't be any fear going into the industry. I think there's more of an issue now around retention, male or female. Um, I think it all goes back to that work life balance. Um, women have babies, and I think that changes a lot of things. Um, and there isn't enough flexibility in our industry to allow for that. So I think that we so need to. How do we fix that? I don't have 
a simple solution. I, I know that I've seen places where it works, where women are offered a bit more flexible schedules. Um, they maybe work more day shifts if it's a restaurant that has um, lunch service, um, and then they have nights off. I do think it's up to employers to find solutions, whether it's just based on the one person or what's best for the business, um, to allow women to stay in the industry. If they want to work, we should be able to find a place for them because there aren't enough. There aren't enough of you as it is, so we should try to do what we can to make it easier. Very good. Well, um, Danielle, thank you very much for your time. Um, big round of applause. Uh, um, for attending. Um, we're very lucky to have you in the country, so thank you. And I suggest you guys, you guys must go and eat in this restaurant because it is fantastic. Uh, Danielle's going to leave the mobile over there and just ring her direct for a booking. <laughs> thank you very much. So next up, um, we have Dan Hong, and Dan's been a, a big supporter of uh, our Inspired series, and. Uh, is a great inspiration for the industry and has come a long way. Um, so a, a warm welcome to Dan, please. How are you doing, Dan? Hey, guys. Yeah, I'm good, thank you. You're, you're, um, you're pretty busy nowadays. Uh, yeah, I'm always busy. Uh, you know, it's just... I guess, you know, working, running a restaurant, or two restaurants, and um, both restaurants are never quiet, so it can be a bit, a bit tough, and, um, but yeah, you know, and just go with the flow, and, um, you know, that's what I do. As I said, you've been a good supporter of this, um, this series, and, and trying to keep staff, you know, take students in it. Um, tell us a little bit about you, um, these guys, not met you or heard from you before, so tell us how you got into it. Your mother's a, a great cook, and, and tell us how you started. Well, look, I uh, my my mother bought a Vietnamese restaurant back in 1993, and so I would always grew up around restaurants. Um, you know, I used to just hang out at my mother's restaurant in Cabramatta after school. Um, she she operated a Vietnamese restaurant in Cabramatta, and. Um, Look, I wasn't doing the best in high school. Uh, she sent me to a private school, and uh, I basically wasted my mum's my mom's money. Um, you know, near the end of uh, my HSC, I got uh, I think I got like 48 in my UAI, which is like a fail. It's not that good. No, it's terrible. And uh, look, my mum just was like, uh, "Look, I'm not going to give you any pocket money anymore. Um, you know, what are you going to do?" And I was like, well, "I don't know." And she's like, "Well." Why don't you become, she should suggest that I become a chef. How old were you then? I was uh, 17. And uh, yeah, so um, look, I always cooked at home because my mum works like 80 hours a week running the restaurant. Um, so Still I always, to this day? No, 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 she retired about six, seven years ago. But um, I, uh, yeah, she worked so long that I was cooking for the family because my dad couldn't cook. And, I never thought of it, you know, I never thought to be a chef in my career because, you know, I always grew up around an industry that I was like, if I'm going to, like, cook like my mom, she works, like, 80 hours a week, blah, 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 blah. But uh, she suggested I become a chef, and I thought, look, I cook at home, I thought I'd just give it a go. Yeah. And, and that's kind of how you fell into cooking, just like that. Just like that. And she, then, she got me my first job. Where was, was that? The first apprentice at Long Grain. Long Grain, yeah, yeah. Terry Hills. Yeah, this was... 2001, so it was, uh, yeah, 16 years ago. Wow, so yeah. Long Rain was obviously the Asian influence in, in cooking, and, and Marty Bowett's a great chef, was that. What, um, what led you to that particular restaurant, that particular chef, and what did you learn? Well, look, Long Rain was like one of the hottest restaurants at the time, it just opened, and um, you, you know, Marty used to come to my mum's restaurant every now and then, and she just called him up, and you know I thought it was a really good restaurant, and you know she just went, look, I can get you this job at Long Rain if you want, and Marty decided to give me a go, and uh, you know, and I, I've never cooked with Thai food before, you know, I've always like ate Vietnamese food, but I've never learned Thai flavors, and um, I thought it was a really good place, really busy place as well, to you know, to you know, start my career, and and. Um what did you learn there? I mean, you know, because it must have been 
it was one of the hardest restaurants and it was busy as you say. The hours were really long and the pay was terrible yeah, and all that sort of stuff. Guess how much I was getting as a first year apprentice. Here we go. Guess how much I was getting 16 years ago. $240 a week. Unbelievable. Yeah. To work they uh, you. <laughs> uh, working about 48 hours. Um, yeah, yeah, right. So what did you learn at Long Grand? What, what, uh, you... Look, it was a very busy restaurant, so I learned to, you know, be quick, be methodical. Uh, my chopping skills were, you know, I, I still, you know, in terms of julienning and really fine cutting, um, I still use the skills that I learned over there. And what the most important thing that I learned uh, working at Long Grand was um, training my palate, because Thai food is one of the hardest cuisines to really uh, gauge, because it's all about the balance between uh, hot, spicy, sweet, and salty, and, and really training my palate to to understand Thai food and seasoning properly is um is, you know a skill or not even a skill like something that you have that you can train yourself to have like for the rest of your life and then it makes you understand other cuisines that have a similar flavor profile. How long did you stay longer? Uh, stayed there for one year. Yeah, and then we and then I got a job at uh, this small bistro called Pillow at the time, and that was a French-English bistro, and at that time, a lot of that movement was getting pretty big in Sydney, sort of like uh, Gordon Ramsay and Michael and all that, and doing people, chefs coming back from London and, and doing that style of food in, uh, in Sydney, so I learned a lot about sort of European cooking, uh, making pasta and making sauces and, and so on, so, you know, every place that I, I learned, I tried to really you know, engulf myself in that cuisine, you know. You know, when I was at Long Grand, I bought all these Asian cookbooks and really tried to train myself about that. And, you know, working at Pello, you know, I, I, I bought all the Gordon Ramsay cookbooks and Marco cookbooks and really tried to, you know, you know surround myself in, in that style of cooking. Do, do, where do you think, you know, for, for advice for these guys, um, and, and Daniel mentioned cookbooks and things like that, you know, where, where do you see, where do you get your inspiration now? And, and, and for these young kids, where, with this, there's a bit of a movement going on as well, you know, there's all, been all these big restaurants, and now it's sort of heading back to small boutique restaurants, you know, like uh, Josh was doing at um, yes. St. Peter and, and, and even Friends sure. and things like that. So w w what direction should these guys take? Because it's pretty confusing out there, isn't well, it? Well, look, I, you know, during my career, especially during my apprenticeship, I think it's very important to start working at um, you know, restaurants that aren't too big. Like, I, I think that working in a small brigade, you know, especially as an apprentice, you start to learn a lot more. Like, you know, at Pelo, it was a brigade of five chefs. And then after Pelo, I went to Mark, which was a brigade of four chefs, you know. So, you know, as an apprentice, you, you know, you learn so much from working in a small kitchen because you get, you have a better chance of moving sections as well. Um, and having a mentor, yeah, well, you, you know, you worked at Bentley as well. Uh, yes. And, and WD50 in New York. Uh, yeah, I just did stars there, yeah. yeah. What, yeah. what do you think of stars as, I mean, for the kids? Uh, Going out well, working for a bit. I think it's good. I think you should you should stars if you if you want to, you know, sometimes it, it's it's a lot harder to get an actual job at these world-class restaurants. So sometimes you, you should, you know, you can go and stage there. but. When you do stage there, you need to make the most of it. You can't, you know, because you're probably going to be put in a corner picking herbs all day. So it's really up to you to really ask those questions and go up to other sections and see what they're doing to, to for you to make the most out of your stage. So you've worked for some great chefs uh, here and overseas. What were the key things that you learned from them that, that is put you in the position you're in today because you you know you, you run several great restaurants? Uh, look, you know, I, I guess as a head chef now, uh, one of the key things I learned from them too is that, you know, in terms of, uh, is really to try and, you know, as you're learning, you know, and then later on when you do become a sous chef or a head chef, you, you really, to, you've got to try and develop, you know, what, what your end goal is, I guess, like, so you, you, you need to have, quite big ambitions in terms of where you want to be in 10 years, you know, so, and then what style you're going to cook and, and, and so on. So, um, you know, that, that's what, one thing I learned is that all the chefs that I cooked for, they had their own identity and, and style, which was, is really awesome to, to learn from them. And then from, from those mentors that you have, you know, 
all those things that you learn can, can influence what you want to cook later on when you open your own restaurant. So you're at Mr. Wall and Miss G now. What got you into them? Because I mean, we saw Danielle's path of writing letters and getting, opening the doors, trying to open those doors. What opened your doors and, and how did you get into where you are now? Uh, look, it, number one, it's a lot of hard work. You know, I didn't get to this point without sacrifices. Uh, you know, when I was 18, from the ages of 18 to 21, I, you know, all my mates were partying and going out every weekend. You know, having 18th birthday parties, having 21st birthday parties. I didn't go to any single one of them, you know, because I had to work. Because you, you've got to realise that on the days in which everyone's going out and having a good time, you're going to be working. So if you look at uh, Christmas period, it's the busiest time of your uh, year. Uh, everyone's drinking. Uh, you know, Father's Day, Mother's Day, Melbourne Cup, all those, all those really fun days where everyone's having a good time, you want to be working. Uh, you know, and that's the sacrifices that you make. Um, as well, why should they sacrifice that? I mean, um, to, to get where you, you've well, got, I guess. You know, for me, I, I sacrificed it because I, I realised that cooking was the only thing I was I realised I was good at. Um, if I wasn't cooking, I don't know what I'd be. I'd probably be homeless. Like, I seriously don't have any other skill other than uh, being creative and cooking. Uh, so that was what sort of motivated me during, you know, the early stages of my, my career. So what motivates you now? So you, you you must go through tough times and think, bloody hell, why am I in this industry and what, what am I doing this for and all that sort of thing. You know, the thing is, I, I went through tough times during the beginning because it was so hard and the hours were so long and there was very little sort of recognition or whatever. But even now, you know, at the stage where I am now, I still have such tough times. And But it's, it's a different, it's, it's different because now it's about trying to find chefs Developing my chefs, making sure my chefs are happy, and it's all about staff retention. Yeah. So, your cuisine, I mean, is, is, is you know, very Asian influence and things like that. When kids are trying to think what direction they want to go, how, how do they know which direction to go in cooking? Do they go for the French style, the Italian style? Well, that, you know, like, like when, if you look at the direction that I went, I. I tried to learn as much as I can in all cuisine. So I went from Thai to like French English to um, Mark, which was like modern French. And then I went to Tetsuya's up there, it was like Japanese. Wow. Can you be an expert in all of them or, you know, or, uh, or you learn? It's good things? to learn uh, every single, a lot of different cuisines have an understanding of, you know, how they balance flavors and, 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 and the ingredients they use and how they run their kitchens and so on. So you can take the best out of each kitchen that you worked at and apply it to your own. And do you, do you encourage young people to travel overseas yourself or do you think that we have a great footprint here that they can learn from? Um, look, I, I think, yes, travelling definitely helps. But I think what's more important is to find a mentor and uh, to, to really develop you at, at the kitchen you work and obviously stay in the kitchens that you work for at least a year. Really, you know, spend your time there because a lot of chefs you know six months is a long time to a lot of chefs these days they think six months they learn everything they can go to another you know another restaurant where they can go be a head chef yeah exactly so i just think you really need to take the time to stay at one venue for at least a year and find a mentor that can really develop you do you have a mentor i have many mentors and uh you know i had I was very fortunate to have enough to, for every place that I worked to have a mentor there. Um, you know, obviously at uh, Long Range it was Marty, at Pillow was Thomas Johns, at Tetsu's it was Martin Ben, um, at, at Bentley it was obviously Brent Savage who showed me a lot about not only cooking but also how to run a kitchen. It was my first sous chef position there. Uh, but now uh, I, my two mentors are probably Frank Roberts, as Danielle said. He's been my mentor for the, nearly 10 years. Wow. Um, and also Justin Hernandez, who um, always has, has this vision that no one else thinks of. And he, 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 you know, he takes you on a ride and you know, 
wants, wants you to be a part of that ride, which is really, really cool. And that's how Mr. Long started. Tell us how Mr. Long started. Uh, well, Mr. Long started, as you know, I probably, I didn't have any training in Chinese cooking. Uh, I never worked at any Chinese restaurants. And, um, but I love, I love to eat Chinese food. I mean, as chefs, we love to go to Golden Century after a busy Saturday night and eat lots of seafood and so on. But uh, we just opened Miss G's. Uh, this was in 2010. And um, we're pretty, pretty busy like, when we first opened. And then literally six weeks after we opened, Justin came down and went, Dad, I want to, uh, I want to close down Tank, which is the nightclub in which where Mr. Wong is. And I want to close it all down and put a Chinese restaurant there. And I want you to run it. And it's going to be like 300 seats. And yeah. And I was just like, oh my God. Like I had to. No try, experience in Chinese. No experience in Chinese. And I just had to sit down for a minute. And I had to get back to Matt. I said, look, I need to think about it. Um, so I thought about it for about five days. And um, I realized, like, I was like, look, I, you know, I've been cooking long enough to understand how to cook Chinese food, and it is a passion of mine in terms of I love eating Chinese food, so that can sort of drive me and, and so on, and um, look, I just, I, I love new challenges as well, and I thought I couldn't do Miss G's because I ran Lotus before that, which was like a 40 seat restaurant, and then opening Miss G's was about 100 seat restaurant, and you know, we could open that, that was fine, so I was like, maybe I'll be long ago, so um, a lot so of research. Now we have the best Chinese restaurant in the country. <laughs> Um, but um, yeah, it's just, it's crazy to think now that five years down the track, uh, Wong is pretty much a well-oiled machine now and, and you know, I would have to say the opening week of Wong is probably the hardest time of my career, just trying to figure out the systems and, and so on. And, um, what I yeah. like about Mr. Wong is that, and it's an important thing I think in restaurants and cooking today, it is so consistent, the food. Mm -hmm. You, you deliver with such high numbers and, and, and things like that. That's a really important thing. How do you keep it so consistent? Well, that, that is our number one priority at Mr. Wong. Um, I think with any restaurant as well, <laughs> you know, but in general. But, but. Uh, look, you, you know, I just, we just, we're just developing the systems in the kitchen uh, in terms of making sure the recipes are fail safe, making sure, uh, you know, the technique of cooking those dishes are, are really, really simple and easy to execute and um, you know uh, that, that, I think that's the main reason why a lot of people still come back to I mean we have customers that we have businessmen that come along like three times a week because they know exactly what they're going to get and that's probably one of the best things about uh, that I pride myself on Mr. Wong is that people are going to get exactly the same yeah. experience every time. Which is a very hard thing to do to keep a restaurant food consistent. We're also with restaurants Dan and, and Danielle has a beautiful restaurant being Fred's, and it's a, a wee bit smaller, but you know, rest of it, we've got a few more tables in there. I don't know what Justin was thinking. <laughs> with, with restaurants and, and things, I mean, chefs, nowadays some chefs think it's all about the food, and now a restaurant, in my opinion, is not all about the food, it's about the flowers, the music, the wine, etc., and the team that serve the food. So. How does that, because it's not just the food that is consistent, your service is consistent, and you're yes. all at the top of all that as well. And it's all about the atmosphere as well. I mean, it's proven now, especially this, this day and age in Australia and Sydney, that the food is not enough. Um, you know, you can, you're talking about reward uh, with Danielle. Um, it, you know, there are restaurants that do have, you know, two hats or a hat. The food is amazing, but everything else doesn't fall into place in terms of the atmosphere and the service and so on. So, and, and they, can, you know, they may, they may have the hats and the recognition, but they're not busy from, say, Monday to Thursday, you know, and at the end of the day, what, why we're doing this, you know, is obviously, you know, we like to create and, and we like to, you know, uh, cook amazing food and be different and so on. But at the end of the day, if you don't have a busy restaurant, then, you know, what is it? Yeah. What is it? Are hats and awards important to you? And were they important as you came up the road? You know, was it important for you to work, work at Mark because it had two, three hats or whatever? Well, yeah, growing, you know, as an apprentice, definitely, you know, you look at those restaurants, you know, as inspiration because, you know, it's always, you know, all these restaurants, 
you wouldn't know about these restaurants if they didn't get the awards and recognition and so on. And you learn, you do learn a lot. Uh, but they, these days, in, in, especially as apprentices, you should start looking at those hatted restaurants to start working because you know you'll, you'll definitely learn a lot there. Uh, but as a head chef now, uh, look, it's great. It's always great to get awards, and um, I like getting them because. It makes it improves the morale of our team because they get recognition, they, they feel validated, you know, um, and that's what I am most proud of. That my, you know, coming back from the awards and going, hey guys, we retained our hat, and these seeing them smile on their faces. But for me, it's like no big deal. As long as the restaurant is busy, I'm happy. That's what motivates me. What's your take on food critics, and, and should these guys be listening to food critics and reading reviews of restaurants in the current market? Um, look, I think you guys have got it pretty good these days because food critics don't have that same power that they used to back when, you know, 10, 15 years ago. You know, I mean, I remember as an apprentice when uh, working at restaurants when we got reviewed on, the, on Tuesday in the Good Living, we'd be packed, you know, for six months every single day, you know, or if you got a bad review, you know, it could close restaurants down. But I think now... Uh, they don't really have as much power as they used to, which is a good thing, you know. Um, but then, having said that, everyone thinks they're critics. You know, if you go on Eatability or TripAdvisor or whatever, um, everyone thinks they're critics and they're more likely to write a bad review. They're more likely to write a review if they had a bad experience than a good experience. Very true. Any questions for Dan? Stand up if you can at the back. Speak out loud if you can. Um, all right, morning, Chef. Morning. Um, as, uh, as Courtney has said, um, I just wondered if you have um, experience that you have in a bad situation when you're doing traffic, and how do you control and you handle that? Like, there's are you there's bad Ramsey, good Ramsey time? Or? Is this like you're talking about now when I'm a head chef and one of my chefs make a, a bad mistake? or? Um, like or back when I was, or yeah. I mean, look, I, you know, the way I was trained was in that sort of court, as you said, yeah, the Gordon Ramsay style, discipline. high dis high intensity, high pressure. You know, make a mistake, you get, you know, you make a mistake. Um, but you know, I've I've learned that you know times are changing, and. Um, you know, it's all, it's all like, I tell, I tell, this is what I tell my senior chefs every day. It's all, it's all fine to like be angry and really have a go at someone during service if they've made a mistake, but you've got to make sure that they, you know, they know that it's for a reason and they, they learn from it. They perhaps. learn from it and uh, they feel almost disappointed in letting the, sh the chef down rather than being like, not in, not caring about it, if you know what I mean. Like, yeah, they should feel disappointed rather than going, "This guy yelled at me, fuck that guy." Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, uh, so that you know, I I always, I always tell my chefs that if you yell at them after service, take them aside and go, "Look, yeah, sorry for yelling at you, but you, you know why? This is what went this wrong. Is why, this is why? Why? This is, yeah, exactly. Learn from it. Yeah. Learn from it. Because I suppose it is the heat of the kitchen, the heat of the moment. You've got right, 300 it covers. And yeah, it happens. I, I, you know, I did it last night to a runner. I was like, take the fucking food now. But then after I was like, like yeah. Yeah, you went and had a glass of wine after. Yeah, it was all good. Yeah. Any other questions for Dan? A research trip to uh, US and Yeah, Mexico. that yeah. wasn't really a research trip. I think it was a party trip. Wasn't it was it? a party trip, so yeah. I'm sure Dan can't answer all of that. Uh, <laughs> well, no, look, these trips are really cool because this the, we went on this trip uh, to inspire us, inspire us to hold this party that we're going to do in October during Good Food Month, and. Um, you know, we were fortunate enough to go to uh, the Noma pop up in Tulum, Mexico, and it was, you know, it was one of the best meals of my entire life, um, and it was really, really inspiring. Even though it, I could probably couldn't apply any of what they did to 
you know, the restaurants yeah. that I run, but, um, you know, it's really, you know, we, you know, I, I take research trips every year um, to Hong Kong and Asia and, and, you know, places like that, and um, I think it's very important, especially as a head chef and an you know, executive chef, you know, you constantly try to think of new dishes, but sometimes you do, you, sometimes you do have a mental blank and you need that inspiration, you need to, you need to travel and see what everyone else is doing. Um, and especially for Chinese cooking, you can't just go to another Chinese restaurant in Sydney because they may not be inspiring enough. So, you know, to go to Hong Kong, to go to Singapore and so on, um, uh, is, is really important, especially as a head chef, and, and to, to help you try and be creative. Um, but yeah, Mexico and LA was really fun. I just got my, my best friend Louie in LA, who runs this restaurant called EPLP. He just took us out for a whole day. We ate just a whole bunch of stuff. And, and it's going to reflect what we serve at this party um, on the 14th of October in Hyde Park. The good food bar. Very good. Lucky last question for Dan, anyone? Yes, with the back again. Uh, as an executive chef, um, what is your next biggest milestone you want to achieve? Because as a, you work at, uh, as an executive chef in Mr. Wong, and then you already have like, chef hats. What's your next one? What do you want? Uh, look, I don't know. I mean, look, I've, I've started to chill out a lot more. Like, I just had my third baby, like, three months ago. Like, I, my, you know, I, I like to have, you know, as we were talking about work-life balance, then that's one of the most important things for me because right now I really need to support my wife in raising these three kids. Um, and my challenge right now is to develop my senior guys, especially my head chefs at Wong and Ms. G's and, and the sous chefs there to run the kitchens without me being there all the time. And, you know, not only just run services, but be in charge of chef recruitment, be in charge of the induction when new chefs start and making sure they're having a good time, be in charge of driving meetings and, you know, making sure that we're all on the same page and, and we're, we all have the same same goal and um, that is uh, I would say my new uh, role as a chef these days it's weird it's I guess it's less sort of doing service and more developing and inspiring my senior guys to make sure that you know they they know so much to when when the day they leave and they they leave and they can run their own restaurant and be successful that is probably um, when I know I've done my job. And nothing's more rewarding than for a chef to that you've developed to leave to leave you, which is obviously it's gonna be hard because they're one of your key guys, but to leave you and open their own place or run their own place and be successful at uh, that, the next venture that they you know they try and do. It's very good. You're um, as we wrap up, you're you're running in a half marathon this weekend, I believe. Yes. And that's for Are You OK Week and, and day today, I think, is it? Yeah, so today is Are You OK Day and it's, uh, you know, it's supporting uh, mental illness and especially in the hospitality industry. We, it's quite we big, isn't it? To, it's quite big and we tend to brush it off because of the high pressure environment. Where, you know, we tend to just go, oh, you'll, be right. you'll be OK, but it's not, you know. So it's, it's, I think it's really important to make ourselves aware about you know, if you just notice any of your friends and family or even obviously your workmates that they, they, they look like they're not, they're sad or not, not themselves and to just really simply ask the question, are you okay? And, you know, that could just help prevent, you know, you know just open, start the conversation, you know, maybe they just want to talk about it and, and it just helps prevent, you know, the worst, worst case scenario, which is suicide. Um, and it helps, you know, pe people struggling with their lives by talking about it really helps them and um, brings us together. And yeah, this is the first, I mean, this is the second time I'm running uh, the marathon, but uh, this is the first time I'm raising money for charity. And I thought, especially after, you know, the, the tragic loss of our great friend Jeremy, um, that, you know, quite suitable to um, try and raise money for Are You OK for the marathon? So, very good. Well, Dan, thank you. You're a huge inspiration to the industry, and, and thank you for giving up your time. And Danielle, again, thank you for giving up your free time today and coming in and talking to the guys. 
Um, a big thank you, and we hope to see you guys in our industry in the future and in these kitchens working and learning, and, and you because you guys really are the future of our industry. So, a big round of applause for both of you. Thank you very much. Some of those I want to photo with both of you.